I would like for all of us right now to, to pray for one friend that we could invite. Could be a neighbor, could be a friend. And the invite is this simple. Hey, I don't know if you're doing anything for Christmas Eve. We'd love to have you join us. Let's pray right now for our friends. God, we just pray that uh, you would open up doors this week as we have conversations with people. Um, as we've been living in front of people, the gospel, there does come a time where we need to say something and we wanna do that this week. Uh, give us the, the little bit of the courage that we need to do that and uh, we pray that, that it would be met with openness and because of that, God, over the next year to two years to two decades, that you would change lives for eternity. Thank you that we get to participate in this ministry with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Favorite movie you've seen this year? Think about that for a second. One of my favorite movies you've never seen is a movie called Erased. Erased, saw it a few years ago. It's the story about a daughter that discovers that her seemingly normal father was a CIA assassin. I thought it was a really good movie. Later that night, while lying in bed, I asked Lisa, would you mind if you found out that I was a secret CIA agent and I've kept it from you all of these years? Like, would you let me keep my job? She said, it depends. I'm like, well, what do you mean it depends? That's terrible. Like, first of all, are you an American? There are bad guys out there that need to be taken out. Second, I get the feeling that you don't think I could actually pull off being a secret CIA assassin, right? And I told her, I am, and I'm just telling you right now, I am a CIA agent. I was recruited in college. And all those times where you see me go out on the Perkioma Trail, what you don't see is the Apache helicopter coming down meeting me behind Wegmans and taking me off to, Ye to, to uh, Yemen, right? And I told her, I was like, I have the perfect job for this because no one expects the pastor of, the ch of a church to be a double agent, to be a CIA agent, right? Now I told her, I can't do what Jack Ryan can do. I can't do what Jack Bauer or Jason Bourne can do. But there's a long, I don't want to tell you guys, there's a long list of normal guys out there that are holding the line against evil. Maybe you're married to someone that is a CIA agent, you don't know that. And that's because we know, and I told my wife, I said I gave her four examples. Here, number one, Detective Alan Gamble, the other guys, proof. Number two, Burt Macklin, FBI. Right, you thought I was dead, so did the president's enemies. Number three, Michael Scarn, threat level midnight. And number four, the best one of them all, Clive Bixby, speaker salesman by day, spy by night. And I told her, I actually have a code, they have a code name for me. I'm, they call me the Sermonator. And that's because I'll take you out and then be back in time on Sunday to preach. So that's why I'm sweating this morning. Anyway, I had a mission. A lot of us wonder what it would be like to live a completely different version of our lives, right? Sometimes we ask, what if we didn't go to that school? What, happened, what would our lives be like if we chose not to be in a relationship with that person, if we chose not to move there, if we chose different things? It's just human nature to constantly think about how our lives would be different if we took a different course of action. The Bible actually says this is possible because the Bible is nothing more than thousands of years of history of people who have two versions of their lives. Think of Joseph, dumb teenager, later became the ruler of Egypt. Moses is a goat herder, leader of a nation. David cared for sheep, led the nation of Israel. Paul was an insurrectionist, became the leader of the church. There are always two versions of our lives when God looks at us. Just think of Deborah in the Old Testament. This is an actual picture, it's in the Bible, you need to find it. This, this Deborah in the Old Testament book of Judges in chapter four is holding the line against 
another country that is coming to attack Israel. They're gonna enslave uh, the people of God. They're gonna do terrible, terrible things to the people. And it was Deborah that stood up. And we're told a story where it was Deborah that lured the commander of their army, Sisera, into his tent, gave him something to eat, gave him something to drink, wooing him, got him to lay down, and then drove a tent stake through his brain. Don't mess with Deborah. Do not, don't mess with a godly woman, all right? She'll drive a tent stake through your brain, right? One day she's raising kids, and the next day she becomes a different person because God's calling her to do that. We're in the middle, we're actually finished in the, the series called Light, and we've been talking about, you know, when you get around the Christmas season, you have feelings of euphoria and goodness. It's gonna be great and families and gifts and that sort of thing, but it's always juxtaposed with this bucket of watery darkness that can be thrown on that. And one of the, the difficulties we have about getting excited about life is that we know in the back of our minds, after it's over, we're gonna go back to our normal lives. But the question I wanna ask us is what if we could change? I want you to think about yourself for a moment. I'm gonna ask you a series of questions. What am I tolerating? What in your life are you allowing to happen? That if God gave you the courage, you could stand up to it. Whose life am I living? Is it mine? Is it the cultural script that was given to me? Is it something that my parents want me to do? Is this something my spouse wants me to do? What is God asking me to do differently? What am I wasting my time with? What opportunities am I missing? Am I being honest with myself? And one that we don't ask enough, am I being selfish enough in a good way? I want, you, I want you to ask yourself these questions because as we do um, think about and ponder that, we're gonna look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is found in a letter that was written to Jewish believers. It was left without a name. In, in, the, in the ancient world, when a document is left without a name, it's because if you ascribe the name to the document, it wouldn't be well received. And so scholars believe this was written by someone that wouldn't be well received, but yet was a leader in the early church. I happen to believe that, uh, along with a number of scholars, that it was Priscilla, Paul's coworker, uh, in the early church. And because she was a woman, she was afraid to put her name to it but it was never in less inspired truth. And so as we read this, I just want you to think about, it. there's a very, very real probability that what we're about to read is read by a woman in the first century. Now, before we get to the ending of Hebrews 11, I want us to ask the question, what was the difference before and after for these people? So the, the chapter 11 of Hebrews ends this way. It says, what more shall I say? I do not have time to talk about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, and David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. That There were others who were tortured, refused to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning they were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They, were a, they went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. 
They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So the before and the after picture, we just read the after of those people, but the before is caused by this. Now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith they understood that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. We're gonna talk about that right after Christmas. I wanna make sure you bring your skeptical friends. I wanna make sure you bring your friends that are teaching in science classes. I want you to bring all of your friends that um, are skeptical about the truth of the Bible, skeptical about the interplay between science and faith, people who are uh, very, very rational in their thinking. We're going to talk about that very topic for two weeks. Um, we're calling it, uh, I think we're calling it um, Science, Genesis, and the Truth. I, I, I hope you bring some friends back to that. I think it's really gonna help people. It's actually, I think it's really gonna disturb fundamentalist Christians the most. We'll get into that. By faith, Abel, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commanded as, or commended as righteous uh, when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. I know this is long, hang with me here. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. Pretty cool way to live, right? Get to the end of your life and you don't even die. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him, and look at this verse, must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Obviously, by all of this reading, you see the secret ingredient, the main ingredient of the before and after, and it's the word in Greek, pistis. Um, um, it's, it's, it is, so if I was to like describe what like the undertones of what that means is, is believing that God will do what he says he will do, even though by all indications of what you see, that's really not going to happen. Faith is believing that God is gonna come through in the way that he promised. Uh, after my conversion, um, I formed a small group uh, with a bunch of guys that I led to Christ and I was friends with and we just all shoved together in the house of an older friend of ours, his name was Jeff. Jeff's mother was a single mom elderly at the time, and she was a speaker at women's events. As a single mom, she said, for 25 straight years, she lived by faith. And I wanna know more, tell me more about that. This was someone I really looked up to. I was like, Pat, tell me more about what it means to live by faith. She said, Brian, there were times when the kids were small, uh, without my husband, that I'm only surviving on my speaker's salary and what churches would give me when I would go and speak, there were times where I couldn't afford groceries. And I said, so what did you do? She said, I took out the checkbook and I wrote a check. And I wrote a check, this was back in the days where you could write a check for your groceries. Do you remember those days, right? You can, if, for those of you who are under 30, you can, a checkbook is something you can see in a museum. <laughs> They're in the museum. And she said, I would write a check and I would hold it up and I would say, God, you promised that you were gonna provide and I need to feed my kids this week. I'm going to the grocery. And she went to the grocery and she said, Brian, I am not lying, I'm not exaggerating, but every single time that happened, I came home and there was a check in the mail that covered that amount. In the back of my mind, I was thinking, why not go to the mailbox first? <laughs> you never know, you know what I'm saying? Go to the mailbox first. Now, 
as friends here, if we can be honest as one another, I would prefer that you read Dave Ramsey's book, The Total Money Makeover, right? And the baby step number one is you're gonna save $1,000 in savings, and the two, your debt snow. I, I, I would prefer you would do that and still live by faith, but I don't want that to take away from the story. The before and after was the very first time my friend Pat said, I believe what you promised, now I'm actually going to live like I believe it. And that is the threshold, that is the moment where we change. For, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit, but considers them foolishness. Now, for the, uh, we joke all the time here uh, that uh, there will be a lot of, particularly men, that will come and they, it's because they have a drug problem, right? Their wife drugged them to church, right? Your, your mom drug you to church. Uh, there are some students here today. You have a drug problem. Your parents drug you to church, right? And, and none of this seems to make sense. And I just wanna say that the reason it doesn't make sense is because of this verse. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them absurd and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit that is given at conversion. And so I was in your seat making fun of everything, not believing any of this, and suddenly, once there was a before and after and I gave my life to Christ, I still wrestled with that, but I said, I'm gonna act in faith. And all of a sudden, stuff that I couldn't explain started to happen. So what we're describing here is we're describing someone that lives by, in the Bible, it's called the sarcos. When you read it in, in the New Testament, like in Galatians, that talks about the sinful nature. The, the sarcos in Greek is this innate thing that inside of us that we're never going to get rid of. And so if you have a back problem, what's the most important thing you can do? Work on your abs, right? I don't wanna show you my abs. I don't wanna show you the, the, the one pack I have in there somewhere, it's somewhere in there, right? But that's what you do for your back. You're gonna work on your abs to strengthen your back. And it's the same thing with the flesh. You're not gonna eradicate that part of you that doesn't want to trust. It's never going to go away. What you have to do is you have to overpower it by building the muscles of faith. You do it once, you do it over again, you do it over again, suddenly you realize with the momentum that comes with obedience, you start doing what the Bible says to actually live by faith and not just thinking at some point I'm actually going to do this. This is so incredibly important. So incredibly important. There's an entire book of promises that God is making to you and he wants you to call him on it and start living by that. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is in Joshua chapter three. The children of Israel have been wandering the desert. They finally get to the promised land and they get to the Jordan River at flood stage where it gets at that point about a mile wide, where it goes downhill about 1,300 uh, feet to the, to the lowest point on earth. And right at that point where they cross, it's a mile wide, it's at harvest time, it's at flood stage, and God says, I want you to cross. And Joshua's like, do you see what we're seeing? And he's like, I didn't ask you, do you think it's doable? I asked you to obey. So it says the priests grab the ark, they touch the edge of the river, and what happens? Nothing. So they take another step. I don't wanna fall off here. And another, and another, and another. What they couldn't see, because it took time, 19 miles upstream, near the city of Adam, 
God dislodged a boulder that came down into the river. And so it took time for the water to die down, but it didn't happen until they took that step. There are some of you that are worrying about your kids right now. You know, like, God, I prayed, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. I, I am doing the stuff and you've taken the step of obedience, but it hasn't happened yet. That doesn't mean he's not at work, it's that God is at work upstream in your life. Whenever someone is coming and like really wrestling with something, I will say, let's pray that you can see God working upstream in your life. So here's my question, what does every miracle in the Bible have in common? Every miracle in the Bible, that is in, that has, what it has in common is everyone is preceded by a problem. Problems are simply God's way of giving you an opportunity to see him at work. And so here's another way of saying it. There's another version of your life that God wants you to live. Uh, so we were going to the airport. Lisa and I were going to the airport and uh, we we're flying out to Arizona to do my niece's wedding. And on the way to the airport, it was early. I was driving. We never wake up early and she says, hey, why don't you let me drive? So I'm driving and if I'm driving, I'm playing my loud music. And if I like a song, I will play it over and over and over again the way Jesus intended music to be played. <laughs> Loud and on repeat. After the fourth time of listening to this song, uh, Lisa said, might I suggest another song? I said, no, this is an awesome song. This song is about, you know, there's this line and I show her, we could be, uh, to lovers in a fable. It's an ode to the person that he loves. And I'm offended that you don't see that in the music. I've already played it. How many times? I'm here, let, let me play it again. And I'm going through the lyrics and that sort of thing. We get on the plane and somehow the discussion went from the song that she hated to, do you think I could be an actor? How we got there, don't know. But in the middle of the flight, I leaned over and said, in the middle of this conversation, do you think I could be an actor? And she said, I don't know. No? Like, and I reminded her about 15 years ago, there was, I've never told you guys this, there was an executive, this true story, God's honest truth, an executive from HBO that came and visited our church. He's a friend of a friend. And he's like, uh, I need to meet with your pastor because I'm gonna turn his life into a reality show. Remember when those reality shows were really big at the time? I was like, I could turn that guy's life into a reality show. And I told my friend, uh, no deal. I said, primarily because here's what it would look like. Here we are in Pastor Brian's life. It's 4.30 in the morning. He gets up, he goes to his desk and he writes. It's noon. He gets up, goes to the office, and then he comes home. That's it. Like, there's, there's, that's not very, very sexy. So anyway, we're talking about me being an actor. And then I said, would you mind if I was an actor and I was a serial killer? And she said, I would have a problem with that. I said, would you mind if my job was an actor and I had to kiss someone in a movie? What would you do if you were married to someone and they had to kiss someone in a movie? I said, would you mind if I did that? She said, no, you wouldn't be allowed to do that. I said, you don't understand. My job is to kiss Jennifer Aniston. It's my job, right? And I said, what if I made $25 million? She said, I'd be good with that, right? <laughs> she said, at least you know my price now, right? We do this all the time. We're like, um, we can play the game of what would my life be? How would it be different and we imagine different scenarios. We imagine a different home. We imagine a different job. Sometimes when things are bad, let's be honest, you might imagine a different spouse. You might imagine if you didn't have this person. You might imagine what your life would be like if you weren't given a particular disability. You might imagine what your life might be like if you weren't born with particular disadvantages in our culture. You might wonder might, what might have happened 
if you actually had a parent that showed up for you. Or God forbid that you had two parents showed up, show up for you. You might wonder all of these things, what might happen for you. And what we think in the sarcos and in the flesh is, is if we had the ability to go back and change these fleshly things, our lives would be different. And God's like, you don't, you don't understand. That's not how I operate. First and foremost, I give you at birth certain disadvantages so that you'll rely upon me. And second, I'm never gonna take them away. Sorry. Brian, I'm never gonna take away your anxiety. I can help you deal with it. I can help you live in a more healthy life, but I'm never taking it away. That's my gift to you. I'm like, I, there are other gifts I wish I had. And so, I wanna go through a list of promises. If you have a phone, I want you to take a picture of them. One promise is God will never leave you. Deuteronomy 31.6, there's never gonna be a situation. You may feel like you're the only person at work standing up for something. You might be in a relational situation and you're like, this is the right thing to do, but everybody else is telling me to do the other thing. I am gonna step out and I'm gonna touch the edge of the river and I'm gonna do it. I don't care if everybody gets angry with me. You will never leave me in this situation. Number two, God will always protect you. God will always be there for you. God will always give you strength for every battle. You don't think that you have the ability to keep on going. You don't think you have the ability to put one step in front of the other and get another chemo treatment. You better believe you don't, but he does. God will give you the strength to endure all suffering. God will forgive you even when you've sinned against him. God will never stop loving you even when you feel like it. And God will meet all of your needs. What would happen just with these seven promises if we started actually living like God was actually gonna start doing this stuff? That's where the before and after comes. Not when you change your circumstances, not when you change all of these deficits that we have in life, it's that when you start living by faith. That's what Hebrews 11 is all about. These people have the same situations as us, even worse. They didn't have all these things yet fixed, but they started living by faith. And so I want you to pray a prayer like this. Jesus, here's my problem. You promise in your word that blank. Until I see your provision, I will rest in your promise. I will not be anxious, I will not fear, I will trust that you are at work upstream in my life right now, amen. Now sometimes you may pray that prayer 50 times, but the 51st time, and the second day, and the third day, and the fourth day, you get to the point you're like, I don't care what I see out here, I'm just totally confident that he's, gonna, that he's gonna work, I am. God, we thank you so much that you give us promises in scripture, that you want us to be the after people. You want us to live by faith, not to think about faith, not to study faith, not to do Bible studies of faith, not to understand the words of faith, but to actually get up tomorrow morning and actually living by faith that you're going to do what you promise you'll do. We thank you that you are a God who is always there, that is always consistent, and that is always working things for our good. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.